The future of the British monarchy lies in the hands of two brothers, Prince William and Prince Harry. As the children of one of the most infamous royal relationships of the 20th century, their childhood was plagued by turmoil and tragedy. Their lives have been played out in the media gaze for better and worse, more than ever before in the history of the monarchy. Determined to continue the legacy of their mother, bridging the gap between monarchy and people with openness and honesty. The relationship between William and Harry is crucial. When Princess Diana died, it was William that put that loving arm around Prince Harry and helped him through the difficult trauma of losing a parent. And I think that brought them even closer together than normal siblings would be. There are only two people who can understand the upbringing that William and Harry have had, and that's William and Harry. They have become endeared to the British public as they remain the most popular members of the royal family. This is their story. Will we see you dancing? Uh, I really hope not. Um, I hope so. And him, not me. I hope we can get a chance to see him dance. It'll be a terrifying sight if we do. It's almost impossible to describe to a stranger or someone who's never met Princess Diana what she was really like. What I usually say is she was as beautiful inside as she was out. The British royal family has long upheld a reputation of silence and distance. After generations of privileged ignorance, one woman was to challenge all expectations and rewrite the royal rule book. That woman was Lady Diana Spencer. Can, is there any possibility of any announcement of your marriage in the near future? Can you tell me? Can you tell me uh, if there's any possibility? I'm not going to say anything. Okay. Oh, Prince sorry. Charles did give us a hint himself. He said we wouldn't have to wait too long. <laughs> On July the 29th, 1981, Lady Diana married Prince Charles and became Her Royal Highness the Princess of Wales in one of the most extravagant weddings in modern history. Well, Charles and Diana met when, when Diana was still a teenager. Um, she was very young at the time. In fact, her older sister had been um, cherry-picked as, as a potential suitor um, for Prince Charles and, and had, in fact, dated. Sarah and Charles did date, but it was Diana who caught Prince Charles's eye. Well, I remember thinking what a very jolly and amusing and, and attractive 16-year-old she was and I mean, great fun mm. and bouncy and full of life and everything. And um, um, I don't know what you thought of me. But... Pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think everyone remembers Charles and Diana's wedding as this fairy tale. I think even the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time referred to it as such. Uh, obviously quite uh, 80s heavy when you think about Diana's huge meringue-esque gown and all of the people in attendance and obviously the romantic venue that was St Paul's Cathedral at the time. And this was an event watched by a global audience of multi-millions, so it was a major, major royal occasion. The fairy tale dress, the golden carriage, the beautiful ceremony at St Paul's, the blushing bride, the proud prince, it just ticked all the boxes. It was the fairy tale wedding. Or so we all thought. Prince William Arthur Philip Louis was born on the 21st of June, 1982. Two years later, on September the 15th, 1984, his brother, Prince Henry Charles Albert David, more commonly known as Prince Harry, was born. By 82, the country had, um, had a new heir, and uh, that was a cause for great celebration. The crowds, the photographers, the world's press were all camped outside the Lindo Wing at St Mary's in June um, 1982. And uh, the fact that Diana produced a little boy, an heir, um, I think just further endeared her to the British public. People loved her even more, and when she came out holding Prince William 
with Prince Charles, images that really just melted, I think, even the most hardened hearts around the country. And uh, it, was, it was a cause for great celebration. Um, Britain had come through a difficult time, and I think the royal family were giving the country something to look forward to. I remember saying to Princess Diana on one occasion when her son was getting taller and taller, I said, you've bred some height into the royal family. And she said, yes, and good looks, and good looks. And what she was talking about was the introduction of her family, the Spencers, into a very tight royal gene pool. And the result was two good-looking sons. Being a new mother, there were, there were obviously challenges for, for Diana, but being a new mother and being a member of the royal family and trying to juggle everything within the confines of Kensington Palace, I think, really did take their toll. Now, Diana did make the decision to hire a nanny for Prince William. I think she was always paranoid, as both of the boys were growing up, that they might become too close to their nanny. In fact, she, she fired one of the nannies, a, a wonderful woman called Barbara Barnes, who both William and Harry doted on, um, because it was Barbara Barnes who William would run to and jump into bed with in the morning, not Diana. So there was that constant struggle of wanting to be the perfect mother and wanting to be the perfect princess. And I think she found it hard to to reconcile those. Remember, she was still very young, um, much younger than Kate is in this position, and I think far less supported. The dismissal of the royal nanny made it clear that Diana did not want her sons to have the traditionally distant royal upbringing. She wanted to be at the forefront of their lives, choosing their first names, their clothes, their nurseries and schools. She was a mother first and a princess second. The boys were incredibly close to their mother, and it was important to her that they were not brought up inside a bubble of royal privilege. Against established protocol, she took her sons to charity visits, as well as restaurants, theme parks, and local towns and shops. She instilled within them an understanding and respect for the everyday person and those less fortunate. Diana really broke the mold. When it came to parenting, she did things differently. She loved to have fun. She loved to giggle, she loved to play practical jokes, and she loved nothing more than cuddling up with her two boys watching TV and watching game shows and soap operas. And the boys were the center of her world. William, although he looks like his mother, is more like his father. He's studious, he's very careful, he's very respectful, he's duty bound. Harry, on the other hand, is a hybrid of the Spencers' red hair and the Windsors, but he has his mother's naughty streak. Harry is the fun guy. Harry was always the boy that would take apart the television set. He would, the video recorder, he would have him bits and want then to put it back together again. Harry was always the soldier. William was always the general. William's education was at Eton College. William's mother, Diana Princess of Wales, insisted that he went to Eton, as did her father and her younger brother, Charles. Prince Charles acceded to this. Uh, he went to Gordonston, where he was thoroughly miserable. He allowed his sons both to go to a very elitist school. It's very elite, it's very expensive, it's very posh, if you will, but it also has a degree of freedom for the, for the pupils. They are encouraged to be self-confident and to find themselves. And when William came there after being at Ludgrove, the prep school, people realized as he had to sign in, every pupil signs into the, uh, the book when they come, that he was left-handed. You know, Diana, she really didn't think Eton was right for Harry. He ended up getting a place and he ended up going and he ended up doing very well. But there was a, a serious thought at the time that perhaps Eton wasn't the right choice and maybe they would look at somewhere else. In the end, both boys went to Eton and in doing so, um, you know, they set a royal precedent. The Wales marriage was infamously turbulent and by the late 80s, it was becoming increasingly clear that the cracks were forming behind the happy family facade. Finally, in 1996, after four years of separation, Prince Charles and Princess Diana divorced. 
and deterred by the loss of her royal title, Her Royal Highness, Diana committed herself to extensive charity work, including an incredibly successful campaign against anti-personnel landmines. She was able to use her favouring in the press to her advantage, and bring to light issues of suffering and disease across the world. I think if Princess Diana and Prince Charles had been ordinary people, they'd have probably got divorced a lot sooner than they eventually did. Um, you had this period of several years where they were sleeping in separate bedrooms, apparently post-1986 they were leading rather separate lives. You've then got Charles going off and not only pursuing his own country interests and indeed his relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles as it now turns out, but Diana also seeking solace from some of her own male friendships and essentially a, a schism has been created in their marriage where they're living under the same roof but very different lives. To anyone in the know, it was very obvious that the Wales's marriage was in real trouble um, by the late 80s um, and uh, inevitably the announcement was made by the then Prime Minister John Major that uh, Diana and Charles were going to separate. Now Diana knew that this was going to ricochet um, and she made sure that the first people who found out that they were going to separate were William and Harry and she actually made the drive to Ludgrove School herself um, to go and tell them and uh, Harry took it very badly of course being younger than William he, he was incredibly upset. William was very stoic and said to his mother well if you're happier if you're going to be happier mummy then this is the right thing to do because of course Diana didn't have many confidants. I think with the palace came a lockdown. Yes, there were some courtiers, but you couldn't really confide in courtiers. There were some close friends, but the person she really often confided in was William. And, and as a young boy, trying to cope with that um, was a huge weight on his shoulders, but it was William who would, who would push tissues under the door to Diana while she was having a good sob in the bathroom. Well, must remember that Prince William had a had to be very quite mature when he was young because his mother, Princess Diana, confided in him quite a lot in, during the problems of their marriage uh, with Prince Charles. And so he was quite, he knew an awful lot, probably a lot more than any young boy of his age would have known. You have to remember that as much as Princess Diana is, is, is famous for her warmth and, and, and just closeness to her boys, they very much did not have a secure, stable, warm family environment growing up. Their parents were divorced. It was very acrimonious for quite a few years. Their father is f quite famous for being cold and distant, at points very aloof. Um, there really wasn't a... Um, kind of a happy family for either of those boys. Diana took it upon herself to give an interview to Martin Bashir, who um, was the presenter of Panorama. Completely unprecedented, a total shock to the royal family um, and to William and Harry as well. I don't think anyone was prepared for this bombshell of an interview. Um, Diana sat down, gave this interview and talked about there being three in the marriage. She talked about her husband's infidelity with Camilla Parker Bowles. She talked about her own infidelity. I mean, she opened up the book in a way that no one had before. The royal family saw it as hanging her dirty laundry in public. They were furious. Charles was livid. And of course, caught in this very ugly crossfire were two little boys, um, William, who was at Eton at the time, who had to deal with the taunts and the other children having seen this interview, um, mocking his mother in her doe eyes as she was talking to Martin Bashir. Uh, very, very difficult for both of them. Harry was more sheltered. He was still at Ludgrove at the time. And um, I remember the headmaster there making sure that newspapers were banned. They were out the way. No one could watch that interview. It was his way of protecting Harry. I think at Eton, it was much harder to do that. William was exposed to everything and he called his mother in a fury and a rage. I remember speaking to Simone Simmons, who was one of Diana's closest friends. It was the one time when William turned on his mother, according to Simone, and said that he would never forgive Diana for what she'd done. I've taken the children to all sorts of areas where I'm not sure anyone of that age in this family has been before. And they have a knowledge they may never use it, but it, the seed is there, and I hope it will grow. Diana, Princess of Wales, has been seriously injured in a car accident in Paris. Her companion, the Haradzai Dodi Al Fayed, has been killed. The driver of the princess's car is also understood to be dead. The accident happened at just after midnight in the west of the city near the Alma Bridge.
On August the 31st, 1997, Diana Princess of Wales was killed in a car accident. The driver of the car lost control at high speed and struck the 13th column of L'Alma Tunnel in Paris. Diana died four hours later in hospital from extensive internal injuries. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. She was an exceptional and gifted human being. In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh, nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. Well, the news of Diana's death was hugely shocking. I remember tuning into the news um, first thing in the morning. My mother came in and said, Princess Diana's dead. And, um, you yeah, know, just absolute disbelief. Um, we just, none of us could believe that this wonderful woman um, had died. Um, the boys were told um, early in the morning before um, they would have had a chance to have turned the news on. Uh, it was Charles who broke the news because William and Harry were at Balmoral. Um, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh were also in residence and Charles had received a call from his private secretary very late in the night um, to say that Diana had been involved in a serious accident in a tunnel in Paris and um, that he would be posted, uh, which he duly was, um, and he was informed that she had died. And so the duty of telling his sons fell, fell to him, and um, it was a truly awful time for Charles, the realisation that um, his estranged wife um, had died, that he was going to have to raise his sons as a sole parent, and in the immediate future, how on earth was he going to break this unimaginably awful, tragic news to his sons, but he did, to William first and to Harry afterwards, and they did that together. William said to Charles, I need to be there when you tell Harry, and he, and he was. You know, I remember the day William and Harry came back to Kensington Palace after their mother died. I remember standing in the hallway and William woke, walked in and shook my hand and asked me if I was all right. I said, I'm very, I'm fine, thank you. Harry ran down the corridor, flung his arms around me and broke his heart. I still remember his tears wet my shirt through. He was broken hearted. I admired and respected her for her energy and commitment to others and especially for her devotion to her two boys. This week at Balmoral, we have all been trying to help William and Harry come to terms with the devastating loss that they and the rest of us have suffered. William was 15, Harry was 12. Their world would never be the same. When the Queen came home from Scotland to address her nation and witnessed firsthand that immense outpouring of grief, I, I don't think anyone was prepared for that. Um, and I think when the Queen saw it, she recognised just how much a part of, of the British nation Diana was and, and what a special place the British people held in their hearts for Diana and therefore there needed to be a proper state funeral. The boys were very quiet and sombre. I, again, I saw them coming through the aisle and my heart ached for them. And even the Queen was moved. And people think that the Queen was hard during that time, but she wasn't. She was touched and moved by it. And if you see that, that speech she gave, you'll see that she was moved. She didn't quite understand it, but she was moved. William particularly took a lot of coaxing to walk behind his mother's coffin. Um, it was something he didn't feel that he was going to be able to do. And it was in fact the Duke of Edinburgh who at the last minute said, you must do it because you'll regret it if you don't. And if you do it, I'll do it. Because the Duke of Edinburgh was never due to walk behind um, the coffin. So to give the boys strength, Philip did it. And it was a, an amazing, an amazing thing for him to do as a grandfather. But I think, um, I think certainly without a doubt for the boys, um, the hardest 
public duty because it was so public for them that they would ever have had to have carried out and uh, they were both so young and the enormity of what had happened the grief that they were coping with I'm sure hadn't settled in by that point but I think hearts broke around the world people watched that funeral all over the globe when they saw the coffin passing and that little envelope on the top with a wreath of flowers with the word mummy which had been handwritten by Harry. Although you had this global superstars funeral which the world was watching because she was this iconic figure at the same time you were reminded that day with those two very small boys walking behind her coffin that actually this was somebody's mother and it almost felt intrusive grossly intrusive to be following those boys on that path in that cortege really and i think equally we have to reflect that those princes have been changed immeasurably by their mother's death Really, there are only two people who can understand the upbringing that William and Harry have had, and that's William and Harry. It's a very unusual uh, way to grow up, and then the addition, of course, the tragedy of losing their mother at such a young age, bonded the boys uh, to an incredibly deep extent. You know, Harry has said that William is the only person he can tell absolutely everything, and I think for William, it's been said that Harry is the only person he can truly be himself with without worrying about anything um, conventionally or how it sounds or comes across or if he seems princely. Um, he can just be himself. Harry and William have a great relationship despite the fact that they're very different young men. Um, um, Harry is much more easygoing and carefree and uh, living by the seat of his pants. And William has always been a bit more serious and studious and uh, sort of a strip more of a straight arrow. However, uh, their affection for each other, their bond is unshakable. William and Harry are um, acutely aware of where things went wrong in the press in their early life. And there's an argument, quite a strong one, to suggest that um, the wheels so spectacularly fell off Diana's life and her public image and how she was um, portrayed in the press and how she was pursued by journalists and photographers that contributed to, to her tragic demise. And I think what you have with William is a guy who has learnt lessons. And there's really nothing any of those grey-suited men from Clarence House could genuinely tell William that he doesn't already know about the press. And he understands the media. He understands that as a royal, you're never going to be elected. But that doesn't mean that public opinion isn't incredibly important um, to you and your longevity. And William, I think, really understands that. He gets it. Um, he is very, very open and willing to, to forge relationships with the press. Um, but. He wants it on his terms, and he does not want a repeat of what we saw with Princess Diana. What you have to remember is that William and Harry are Diana's sons, primarily. Yes, of course, they're Charles's sons as well, but Charles was never there. Diana was always there. She fed them. She was there at mealtimes. She changed their nappies. She was there at bath time. She read them bedtime stories. She fetched them from school. Charles didn't. Diana instilled in those two boys her hopes, her dreams, and her ideals. So what you see in William today is an extension of Diana. Neither he nor his brother could say that there were great academic shapes. They weren't. Princess Diana said famously, I'm as thick as two short planks. And Prince Charles is probably um, educated beyond his intelligence. Uh, he has a lot to say about a lot of things, but he could not be said to be an intellectual, though he has aspirations that way. After completing his A-levels, William spent a gap year overseas. He took part in British Army training exercises in Belize, visited Africa, and spent 10 weeks teaching children in Chile. Basically, um, I wanted to do something constructive um, in my gap year, rather than, um, I mean, uh, 
I could do quite a lot of work, but I thought this was a, a bit more of a way of um, making, uh, trying to help people out and uh, meet a whole range of other different people from um, different countries, and at the same time uh, helping people um, in remote areas of Chile. <laughs> By 2001, he was back in the UK and had enrolled at the University of St Andrews. It was here where he fell in love. William and Kate actually met when they were both 16. Um, William was at Eton, Kate was at Marlborough, and they had a mutual friend in common. She was then called Amelia de Langer. Uh, she's now known as Amelia Patterson. And she is, of course, Prince George's godmother. And she introduced the two of them. So there was a meeting many years before they actually met at St Andrews. But of course, it was at St Andrews where that friendship, because it was initially a friendship, flourished. Um, William and Kate were at the same halls of residence at St Salvador's. They were on the same course in the same year. I mean, some people say, wasn't that just too much of a coincidence? Um, but it was how things worked out. And uh, they spent the first year um, as undergraduates really getting to know each other. William was not particularly happy in his course. They were both doing history of art. And uh, Kate was was really great actually at trying to keep him focused, keep him incentivized, and actually stop him from leaving St Andreas, which was at one point what he wanted to do. Um, he didn't leave, he switched course, and they spent the next four years living together and falling in love. Um, I think the wonderful thing about St Andrews was it was a bubble away from reality. It was, it was a life that Prince William had never been able to enjoy, whether it was going to the local shops, going to a local bar, going for his morning swim. He could get on with his life and his relationship in private. And I think the pair of them absolutely loved those years. They look upon those St Andrews years with, with great fondness. And uh, they are patrons of St Andrews University because they feel such a strong connection to that place. This is a very special moment for Catherine and me. It feels like coming home. Despite being one of Europe's leading research institutions, the third oldest university in the English-speaking world, and of course, far and away the best university in the world, <laughs> St Andrews still has that uncanny knack. <laughs> St Andrews still has that uncanny knack of feeling like home. As they said, you know, by their own account, they said that they were friends first and then the romance began. And it, it, it seems that the royal family were protecting William. It's, it's about William to start with, but then William and Kate when the relationship began because they did a lot of their early courting in, in St Andrews at the Queen's estate in Balmoral. Away from prying eyes, lots of privacy, lots of time to develop the relationship. So that seems to have been um, a key factor really in, in, in him being left alone. And there was still, let's not forget, that there was still that sense that these boys, William and Harry, had suffered a terrible, and they had, you know, it's a fact, they'd suffered a terrible, terrible loss in their teens. And it, it would have been, it would have, particularly given how their mother died, it would have seemed so awful to ignore that respect and that space that he needed to develop and grow up. And, and l largely he was given it. And St Andrews was maybe, you know, what we've just characterised the university, but maybe it was the perfect place to do that because it's a little bit off the beaten track. And, you know, having Balmoral up the road always helps. Well, talking to a royal insider several years ago, she told me that one of the reasons William fell in love with Kate Middleton from the very beginning was because of her family and her close relationship with her siblings and parents. As much as William fell in love with Kate, he definitely fell in love with the Middleton family at the same time. Um, you know, he would lie on the couch with his head in the lap of Mrs. Middleton, or he would sit after dinner and, uh, and talk for hours with Mr. Middleton. He loved the way uh, Kate was very friendly and playful with her brother James or her sister Pippa. Feeling a part of that very close knit, tight, a very British family was the first time in his life that he'd ever had that experience. And for William, it was utterly intoxicating. A lot of us in the press have complained that Kate Middleton has become so boring because there's really nothing ever to write about. She wears the same shoes, she wears the same knee length skirts and, and really never says anything controversial. But that's exactly what the queen and the rest of the royals love about her. Prince William, having decided to pursue a military career, was admitted to the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst in January 2006. 
After successfully completing the course, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant at Sandhurst on December 15, 2006, joining his younger brother Harry in the Blues and Royals. The Prince's enthusiasm for deployment was repeatedly squandered. It was deemed too dangerous to put the second in line to the throne into the field. In 2008, it was announced that William would transfer to the RAF in order to fulfill the active role he desired without being deployed into combat. I think nothing ever prepares you that well for what you're going to see and some of the, some of the incidences. When you're working with a team, um, you, you, know, you help each other out and you talk about it and uh, you, you get through it that way. And so it's very important to talk about it. Prince Harry's military experience was fraught with security concerns. He joined Sandhurst in 2005, and in 2006, it was announced that he was to be deployed to Iraq the following year. This led to a fierce public debate. In May, just before the Prince was scheduled to be deployed, the head of the British Army, General Sir Richard Dannat, announced that Harry would be too high value a target and endanger his fellow soldiers thus would not be deployed. Harry made public his disappointment, but accepted the decision. I wouldn't have joined the army unless I thought I was going to. Um, simple as that. Um, if, if they said, no, you can't go front line, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't drag my sorry ass through Sandhurst, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am now. In February 2008, the British Ministry of Defence revealed that Harry had been secretly deployed to Helmand Province in Afghanistan. There he operated as a forward air controller. He helped Gurkha troops repel an attack from Taliban insurgents and patrolled hostile territories. Harry attended the Defence Helicopter Flying School at RAF Shawbury, joining his brother William, who was completing his training to be a search and rescue pilot. Um, I think the, the struggle that I was talking about was mainly the exams and stuff like that. I mean, we, when you sort of the helicopter course, you start with what, something like four or five weeks of uh, ground school and exams. Um, exams never been my favourite, and I always knew that I was going to find it harder than most people. Um, but I'm through that now, and uh, finally got hands on to uh, to a job that I absolutely adore. It is still hard work, but um, but I'm better than William, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's that you've bad. been helping him with the exams. Uh, yeah, an awful lot. He needs a lot of help. So, uh, yeah, it's the RAF way, so you have to help the army out quite a lot. And does it come down to sort of mental maths tests? Or? Uh, yeah, a bit of that, you know, a few trick questions, try and catch them out. Seven eights? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> lots of that. <laughs> but Harry, seriously, is it, for you, is this fundamentally and crucially about getting back to the front line? Um, it is. I've always had a love for helicopters. Um, I've always wanted to be a pilot mainly of helicopters more than fixed wing, even though I'm slightly under the impression that fixed wing is probably easier than helicopters, especially as these things aren't designed to fly. But um, I'm really enjoying it. And, you know, as, as everyone knows, it is my easiest way of getting back onto the front line. Um, and maybe safer, maybe not safer, I don't know. Um, but there's a bit of pressure from, from certain places, which I'm sure you're aware of, of the reasons why I'm allowed to go back. And if I do go back, then Apparently, I can't do the same job as I had, so I'm looking somewhere different and more, more of a challenge to try and become a helicopter pilot. Was it made pretty clear to you after the last time in Afghanistan that it would be your first and last time, that it was too risky for you to go back as a, as a soldier? Uh, more the fact that I think the media had said that they would never keep their mouths shut um, if I went and did the same job, so I'd have to do something different if I wanted to go, yes. But you are hopeful, confident and, and passionate that you do get back by this means, that you get back to the front line? Massively so, unless they stop flying helicopters out in Afghanistan soon, which hopefully they won't do. But, you know, as I said, I love flying helicopters, or I'm loving flying helicopters at the moment. I just hope that I can be better than better than the best. You know, that's what I always strive to be, to be, you know, spot on. But, you know, as I said, to get out to Afghanistan again would be fantastic. And my best chance is to be a helicopter, is to do it from a helicopter. And so, you, um, you got off the ground yet? Sorry? You got off the ground I yet? I just got off the ground, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Sorry, I've known those two boys, William and Harry, since they were born. Um, I used to change their nappies. They used to call me Uncle Paul. I've always been there and I've watched them grow. I'm very proud of them. They're lovely boys. But the public must know William, although he looks like his mother, is more like his father. He's studious, he's very careful, he's very respectful, he's duty bound. 
Harry, on the other hand, is a hybrid of the Spencers' red hair and the Windsors, but he has his mother's naughty streak. Harry is the fun guy. Harry was always the boy that would take apart the television set. He would, the video recorder, he would have in bits and want then to put it back together again. Harry was always the soldier, William was always the general. So when my two boys visited and they played war games, William had an army that he could direct. He was always the leader. That was his role from the moment he was born. But Harry's happy to muck in. So if I needed help in my pantry at Highgrove, if he needed help mucking out the stable, I'd be there for him, he'd be there for me. Harry will muck in with anyone. Harry's a fun boy. I don't like to see him put down in the media. I like to say Harry's a great boy. Give him the chance to prove it. And I think you'll see. You sort of have the three Harrys, really. The, the sensitive little boy, the fighting man, and, and the idiot. <laughs> and I think people love him for all three of those things. He always yes. smiles, he has a positive. Yes. He's so happy every day, every time. Yes. And uh, that's why he, we love him. <laughs> He looks gorgeous. Um, I think he's divine. I think it's probably very difficult being the second son because you don't really have a defined role. You're just the, the joker in the pack. The, the, the attention is very much focused on the eldest child, as it was with William. I mean, Diana made a very conscious effort not to allow that to happen, but of course it did. Harry became important by you know being this big character, being this brave boy, so I think it is it does it does affect these kids. I mean, when you look at Princess Margaret, she never found the happiness she should have done. She was always completely in the shadow of her elder sister because her elder sister was queen. And when you think of the Queen's children, and Princess Anne said she used to feel like an also ran. Yeah, in. Uh, January 2005, um, I, I ran a story about Prince Harry, a picture that we got of Prince Harry going to a party actually with William uh, and he was wearing a Nazi outfit. Um, it created a huge stink. William's reaction to the Nazi story when he had a chance to bend my ear about it was, was very sweet and it was a sort of the way I'd like my big brother to stick up for me if I'd been put in the papers and, and obviously something I'd done had upset people. So, yeah, I mean, there, there is something very special with William and Harry. That they are extremely close. Um, and anything bad for Harry, William will stick up for him to the nth degree. And, and likewise, Harry's very protective of William and now Kate as well. Harry is a party creature. He always will be. Um, so obviously he's going to get caught out. Prince Harry I won't say dropped out of school, but he came very close to dropping out of Eton. He left with some rather appalling exam results. Um, and there was a delay before he joined the army, which was really his only option. University wasn't on the table. In that period, I think Harry now, by his own admission, would say that he went through a very bad patch um, and got himself in all kinds of scrapes. The Nazi outfit being just one of quite a long list. Punching a photographer outside a nightclub was another. Um, Harry learnt a lot in that small period of time um, and I don't think at that stage in his life anybody could have said anything to him that he would have taken notice of but luckily he's, he's grown up since then. And then of course there's the notorious strip uh, at Vegas which was really, really wild. Um, every misdemeanour that Harry's had has sort of leaked out to the press because we all want to see Harry being Harry. I think when it comes to Prince Harry, it's obvious that there's huge affection between the two brothers. Even when he was very little, when he was 10, 11 years old, and he'd see the girls starting to scream because Prince William was coming along because he was that bit older and they could see he was very handsome. He, we're told Prince Harry would, would encourage the girls to scream and, and just because he knew it really embarrassed his brother. So he seems to be the more playful one, Prince Harry. And again, that would bear out what the Princess of Wales said in that Panorama interview about He's a more uh, sort of more of a more of a Spencer wild child than than William is, and and you, we can see it, can't we? In 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 the the pictures we see and his antics and the kind of things he likes to do, and 
But I also get the, the impression from the, the times we've seen the two together talking to one another and about one another and about that, because they've, they've spoken about their, their closeness as brothers, that you get the feeling that Prince William, for all his understanding of the seriousness of his role in the future, you get the feeling that he makes it very clear that he needs his brother and he values that um, more perhaps childlike fun element that's in his life. Um, which I think is a fantastic testament to, to both their parents, but I just think it's a really, because whatever, whatever the Diana story is, whatever happened, it's just so sad that a really young mother didn't see her sons grow up. And it's just such a lovely legacy, I think, for any mother who, who's, who's been lost to her children. Such a great legacy that they seem so close. Harry, I think, has warmed slightly to the press in recent years, but I think both of them, deep down, probably don't like us that much, and we can understand that. Well, Harry and Kate have a very warm, affectionate relationship. You know, Harry grew up without a sister and without a mother to a great degree. And Kate gives him a feminine perspective and a feminine uh, touch that he really was lacking, uh, I think, growing up. And it's really nice for him to have that kind of family member. They're very close. And in fact, it's been widely reported that Kate has been involved in, let's say, helping Harry select suitable young women and advising him about some of his choices. Uh, I think whoever Harry ends up with uh, needs to get along with Kate because Kate is a very strong presence in Harry's life and is, you know, has strong opinions. So I think Harry very much wants the kind of girl that Kate would like. And I think her opinion is very important to him. I think he seeks her advice about girls. And um, ultimately, you know, he wants to bring home someone that says widely respected and loved uh, the way his sister-in-law is. Uh, the more family and children that William and Kate have and the more sort of mumsy she gets, the more the more people are going to want naughty Harry. So I don't see any respite for him, I really don't. I think people are going to want more of Harry because he's still the Bachelor Prince. From 2005 to 2010, Harry was seeing Zimbabwean national Chelsea Davey. In 2012, he dated Cressida Bonus for two years. Chelsea and, and Cressida have both loved him very much and, and they both probably felt differently about it, but neither of them fancied that kind of life. In 2016, it was reported that Prince Harry was seeing American suit star Meghan Markle. In 2017, they remain together, and sources close to the prince say Harry is the happiest he's been in years. In April 2005, William took the decision to take Kate Middleton, his new girlfriend as she was then, on the skiing holiday with her father and with Prince Charles in Klosters in Switzerland. Now, of course, the fact that Two years in a row, suddenly this pretty brunette that we didn't know anything about was being brought on holiday again with, with Prince Charles and William. That caused massive media attention. It was a frenzy, frankly. And just about every skiing photographer across the Alps rushed to Klosters to try and get pictures of Kate. Um, on that holiday, I met up with William and Kate and Harry in a nightclub um, in Klosters quite, quite late at night, but we had a long chat um, and William wanted to know, quite bizarrely really, I thought it would be obvious, but he wanted to know why all of a sudden there was just this enormous media storm around his little skiing holiday in the Alps. And of course I found myself in a position where I was having to explain to William, who I'm sure knows better than I did, that we were naturally interested in a girl that frankly can be a future Queen of England. Um, and, you know, I think, I think he understood it, but I think he wanted me to tell him. Um, and it was at that time that he laughed. I remember him laughing and just saying, well, I don't know what the fuss is about. I don't want to get married until I'm 28 or maybe 30. Um, and I'm naturally not likely to forget um, those words. But it's quite interesting now that, that uh, maybe five, six years on from that chance meeting in a nightclub and... Actually, he was, he was giving me a scoop. I just perhaps didn't realise it at the time. What we know about the engagement was that William whisked Kate off to um, his favourite part of the world, Kenya, where he went when he was on a gap year. Um, took her off, hid the ring in his rucksack and waited for the opportunity to sort of finally, after all these years, pop the question. Now, 
Kate subsequently said that she wasn't expecting it. If that's true, then I'd really question Kate's... I don't know what planet she's been living on, but that was the most eagerly anticipated moment, um, surely, in, in royal history for the last sort of 30 years. And when William asked Kate um, to marry him, he made it very clear that she wouldn't have to um, leave her family behind her once she married in to his family. He promised her that they'd always stay a part of the family, and they have done, um, whether it's joining the Queen at Ascot or being on an important barge within the Queen's fleet at the Diamond Jubilee celebrations, um, being the first visitors to go and see Prince George when he was born, even before the future King, Prince Charles. All of these things are very significant because they're William's way of saying, you are part of this family and we are going to include you. A genuine, open, quite gentle, she seemed like quite a gentle person actually, and seemed to be pleased to be there, which I think has got to be the absolutely central thing, that you, if you're going to take on a job like that, you have, to, you have to try and like it. I think were Diana here, I think she would approve of Kate Middleton. She might feel slight, like, like some mothers do, oh dear, I don't want to lose my son to any woman, you know, but I think she would approve. She would see in Kate Middleton some admirable qualities and she'd feel that she, her son would be safe with her. I'm sure of that. I think she would approve of it immensely. And I think it was very telling that he chose to give Kate Middleton his mother's engagement ring. And he said, I want my mother to be part of this, to be present. Not in a sinister way, of course not, not the ghost at the feast, but there to enjoy the celebrations and the fun of it all, uh, of a great occasion. William's decision to give Kate his mother's engagement ring, um, for, for outs outside observers, we might look at that and say, that wasn't a great marriage, really, on the grand scheme of things. I think what it means for William um, is a far more sort of intimate, has a far more intimate meaning. Um, Prince William will rarely ever talk about his mother publicly. He will very, very rarely do anything to kind of draw comparisons with him and his mother. Um, and certainly he hates the thought that Kate might be seen as the new Princess Diana. But his decision to give her his mother's engagement ring, I thought was very significant because it, it, it sort of showed that William wanted his mother on his big day to be right there at the very heart of, of what was going on. And, and actually it was quite, you know, in a, in a non sort of soppy way, I thought it was, it was quite touching that he chose to give them that ring. Of course, if he decided to go down to the local jewellers and buy a little engagement ring, then he would be accused of airbrushing Diana out of history. And certainly Prince William's never going to do that. His mother is still the most central figure in his life. He's chosen someone who will toe the party line, who will do as he advises. Someone who loves him and he loves her. It's plain to see they love each other. I think it was very important to William that Harry approved of his choice of wife. And, you know, Harry and Kate spent a lot of time together before the wedding and they have a fantastic relationship. In fact, at the wedding, Harry referred to Kate as his sister, the sister he always wanted. So they have a beautiful relationship and Kate coming into that picture has only added to things. I think Harry very much uh, envies and looks at the relationship William and Kate have in the family. I think he very much wants that. And we've seen from Harry an attempt to get serious with a couple of uh, very suitable young women who ultimately were not so enthralled about becoming a princess. And that was a big strain on the relationship. I think Harry's finding it difficult to find his own Kate. Um, he likes, you know, uh, carefree, wild, somewhat wild party girls who have a certain type. Um, and a lot of those girls don't necessarily want the strictures of being um, in the public eye as a royal. Um, they're quite wealthy in their own right. Some of them want to be actresses and they don't really want the life that Harry can give them, believe it or not. And you just, uh, finally, you feeling a little smug today because you managed to do your stag do without any media knowing? <laughs> well, um, possibly. Um, it's quite good news always to at Fox the Media. But uh, it, was, uh, it was a military operation and uh, my brother and I are very proud of how it went. I, I thought you would be, but now that you've done it, can you give us a hint of what you did? <laughs> oh no, Peter, you know I can't do that. I'm being tapped on the shoulder, but could you, were you, did you have a sore head at the end of it? Uh, 
Again, <laughs> no, you're not getting anything out of me on that, Peter. Not a chance. Just one last, last question. I know Mick's going to strangle me at the end of it, but just could you give me a sense? You know, it's just under a month to go. Is there any aspect of the wedding that's sort of giving you sleepless nights? The whole thing. <laughs> How's that? Uh, no, I was telling everyone I did the rehearsals the other day, and my my knees started going tapping quite nervously. So it's uh, it's quite a daunting prospect, but very exciting, and um, I'm thoroughly looking forward to it. But there's still a lot of planning to be done in the last four weeks. On April 29, 2011, an audience of two billion people tuned into the royal wedding. The service was intimate, with a significance placed on the importance of keeping the Middleton family close to the couple. It was a modern royal wedding for a modern generation and set the tone for the kind of royal family and the kind of king and queen William and Kate will be. The Middleton family are paying for some of the wedding and the, the costs are going to be split between the Middleton family, the royal family and the, the state um, costs will only cover transport and security issues. So all of the rest is being paid for by the, the royal family and the Middletons themselves. Um, on the day, as I said, the ceremony begins at 11. Uh, after that, there is a reception um, uh, hosted by the Queen at Buckingham Palace. Because it's Prince William, it, it, it will inevitably be a mixture of private and state guests, so that will be, hence the Queen being the, the hostess of that one. And then later there's a dinner and dance that Prince Charles is hosting at, again at Buckingham Palace. Um, but we do know that the costs are going to be split those three ways, between the Middletons, the Royals and, and the state. And again, there are comparisons, not just with 1981, when that, that was the case as well, that, that they, you know, it was a time of austerity in the 80s and in the, uh, the Queen and Prince Philip's wedding. Same again, 1947, you know, th there was a sense that they couldn't have too showy a wedding because people were, you know, still living on, on rations. And there, it, it's interesting that there is that, that sort of thread between the three, between the three weddings. Um, and it was a, straight away, actually, or a, a, really quickly after the engagement, it was announced that Kate and William were very keen to find a balance between, you know, a joyful celebration and sometimes lavish, everybody throws money at their wedding. Um, and, uh, you know, bearing in mind the economic times that we're in. I mean, the fact that she's arriving in a car, for example, and not arriving in the state carriage and all of that. She'll, she'll leave in the state carriage, but she won't arrive in it. That again says, I, I think it says, this is different, this is modern, we're young and bits of it, we're doing our way. Well, the birth of Prince George was really like a national celebration. Well, actually, I've covered the royal family for 25 years and the excitement around the birth of Prince George's surpassed most of the things I had covered, actually, even the royal weddings. And uh, it was a huge bun fight, if you like, outside um, the Lindo wing of the St Mary's Hospital Paddington. There were hundreds of journalists there, as well as camera crews and members of the public. I am going to be coming on again for the second time, hopefully. So, um, yeah, it's um, very exciting news. I can't wait to see my brother suffer more. Um, and with any luck, if it's a girl, then he'll suffer even, even greater, I think. I'd love to see him try and cope with that. Just two years after the birth of Prince George, on May the 5th, 2015, Princess Charlotte was born and became the fourth in line to the throne. Well, I think when it was announced that they'd had a little girl, it was a, it was a great cause of national celebration. Of course, a little sister for Prince George, the daughter that Prince William had always wanted, the granddaughter that Charles had always wanted, but actually, historically, a really important little girl because she will hold her place in the lineage of succession. The antiquated male primogeniture laws were outcast um, just before Prince George's birth in case he had been a little girl. Now, had those laws not been changed and had the couple or other the couple to go on and have another child that may be a boy, well, Charlotte would have lost her place in succession. With the laws being changed, she will hold on to that position. She is the fourth in line to the throne, and no little boy born hereafter will take that place away from her. So she is historically very, very important. 
Well, the Middletons are very actively involved in the lives of William and Kate and baby George. In fact, they moved in uh, to the home with William and Kate for several months prior to the birth of the new baby, uh, just to kind of oversee the housekeeping staff, make th sure things were running smoothly, prepare Kate's favorite smoothies, whatever it was, they wanted to fill in the gaps uh, for Kate as she prepared to become a mom for the second time and looking after a very busy toddler, albeit with a lot of help. Um, it has been somewhat interesting to note that Prince Charles and Camilla have been less involved with the Kate William family, and it has been a matter of some controversy. There were quite a few royal reports from insiders saying that Charles was unhappy and felt he was being shut out a bit in the life of Prince George, and that Carol Middleton and her husband Michael had kind of taken over, usurped his position within the family. And um, there have been quite a few rumors that Charles and Camilla felt a bit slighted and would like to be more actively involved in the young family's life. Having said that, I think it's been, you know, demonstrated again and again the kind of uh, parent and family that William wants, and he's certainly going to be getting a lot more um, help and inspiration from the Middleton family than he is from his own father, perhaps. That's not to say that Charles won't be involved or um, have a part to play in Prince William's life, but I don't think he's going to be modeling Father of the Year anytime soon. Well, they managed to score quite a hat-trick with um, Princess Charlotte's name. Charlotte, obviously the feminine form of Charles, but I think more importantly, just a name that they absolutely loved. Um, but Elizabeth and Diana, well, hugely important names. Elizabeth, a great tribute to the Queen, and Diana, which I think was probably the most surprising of all the three names. I think there was a lot of speculation. Would they include Diana? I think many people felt that they probably wouldn't because it would be too much of a, a millstone around this child's net. But actually by including it as the third name, the tribute was there, the sentiment was there, um, but no one really knows anyone's third name, if you're lucky enough indeed to have a third name. So it's there, but it's not too prominent. So I think uh, it, was, it was a perfect choice and, uh, and it's a very beautiful name. Well, recently, William kind of cemented his role as an ambassador for Britain with his trip to the Far East. You know, uh, when he went to China and Japan, he was greeted the way a president or a prime minister would have been greeted by meeting with the heads of state of both countries. In fact, he had a very nice conversation with the prime minister of Japan, as well as the governor of Tokyo. You know, uh, when Prince William went over there, he very much went to support British commerce, industry, and trade, as well as some of his own charitable causes. He actually spoke out against poaching when he was in China in support of one of the charities that he supports. What was interesting about the whole experience is that William is really emerging into his own right as a spokesman for Great Britain. And he is stepping out from behind his father and his grandmother's very long shadow as, a, as an individual who's representative of this great country. Kate will do her own thing. She will establish herself in her own way. And I think she will be uh, a queen consort for the modern age. I think we're going to see a British royal family that is scaled down to some extent. I think some of the stuffiness and starch will be taken out of it. I think that there will be immensely good leaders in this particular context. And I think they will blow a breath of fresh air through the rather stuffy corridors of Buckingham Palace. And I think they will do extraordinarily well. Well, what's important for both William and, and Harry is that this circle of trust, it's quite difficult for them to trust um, wider circle of friends because they're very uh, almost paranoid if you like about leaks to the media the likes of people like me they don't like their private life out on, on the front pages they realize that part of their life has to be played out almost in the theater of uh, public opinion but they don't like that so the relationship between William and Harry is crucial they don't spend an awful lot of time in each, each other's pockets I think we get this impression that they're always together that's not the case but they are uh, extremely close I mean there's no doubt that when Princess Diana died it was William that put that loving arm around Prince Harry and helped him through the difficult trauma of losing a parent and I think that brought them even closer together than normal siblings would be but yeah I mean there's there's no doubt they're extremely close he's he, you know he loves popping around to the to the house um, at Kensington Palace he loves spending time with Prince George but they're not in they're not together all the time I think the media get this impression that they're almost all living together because that's the way it, it appears in public it's quite incredible to believe that, that it's nearly two decades since Diana passed. Um, I think what's so amazing is, is how William 
and, and Kate, to her credit, have been determined to, to continue her legacy, and Prince Harry as well. Let's not forget all the amazing charity work that he's done. Prince Harry said when he was 18 that he, he promised he would continue the legacy of his mother's work, and he's done that through the incredible work he does in Africa. Kate is doing it by wearing that ring every single day, um, by naming her daughter the third name after Diana. William as well, encompassing Diana in so many ways, and the fact that he chose the apartment at Kensington Palace. I think all of these things are very deliberate moves to keep Diana's memory alive. Yes, she was the people's princess, the Princess of Wales, but she was William and Harry's mother, and I don't think they ever want her to be forgotten. And actually, it's quite astonishing that there is no permanent memorial to Princess Diana in this country. There is a fountain in Kensington Palace, but there's no statue, and um, there's no Diana Memorial Day. Um, and I think, therefore, it has fallen to William and Harry to do everything in their power, be it a concert for Diana, be it naming their daughter after Diana, to make sure that she lives on. She cared, she cared massively. We've been left in no doubt at all that we were the most important thing in her life. And then after that, it was everyone else. Really caring, so sweet, and very much missed by not only us, but I think a lot of people.